Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Velocity Banking people, Kingdom Citizens, Infinite Banking people. I have a wonderful guest with me today whom we collaborated earlier. If you haven't already watched that video with uh, Carmen and Darius and myself, it was awesome. Got great feedback on both sides. And so we're going to take that same approach today on my YouTube channel. I'm bringing Carmen and Darius into my kingdom, into my universe. And um, we're going to have a great conversation. Uh, so God bless you guys. Thank you for joining me. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you guys got started? Just a nice little summary of you guys' story so that you can uh, you know, share it with my audience. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Denzel, for allowing us to, to, to be on your channel and be a part of your kingdom today. Um, so my name is Carmen. And I'm Darius. And uh, we are, we're, we're just normal people we're trying to make some money, make a buck. And so uh, I would say our financial journey really started where we discovered Dave Ramsey and was just trying to get our personal finances together and got to a certain point in the baby steps where we said, wait a second, we need to make a little bit more money or do this more aggressively. And then we said, what else is out there for us? And we, we stumbled into the world of real estate. We stumbled into the world of investing and creative financing and, and really latched on to uh, what we consider the infinite banking concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once our understanding of finance really took off um, in that transition from real estate to infinite banking, um, that's when things started to change for us. Our, our financial life started to change and our understanding really, really took off. Exactly. So one thing that I've noticed in our world of creative finance, untraditional methods, is the awesome stories of people's like horrific adventure that they <laughs> take from exiting the Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman world into this, you know, uncharted territory. So do you guys have like a war story on just how did you break apart from that, you know, traditional Dave Ramsey, don't spend any money, become a minimalist, frugal, uh, you know, rice and beans diet, like, what made you actually break from that? What was it? Was there a defining moment? And like, how many friends did you lose on the way there? Because I'm sure people think you're crazy. And still to this day, I mean, I know yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. And I get it from family members, like people alienate you, you know? Oh, yeah. So oh, tell yeah. me about that. <laughs> I, I would say, I think first and foremost, it was the rice and beans, beans and rice, because we're foodies. And we was like, this ain't, this ain't possible. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> our food of choice was oodles and noodles during that time. Yeah, we were like, uh, this isn't sustainable. It was cool for a week, but this ain't gonna happen long term. <laughs> but um, but to be serious, it, it was just really um, Darius and I at that time were chasing the the white picket fence syndrome, mm -hmm. the 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 uh, American dream. So we, you know, in our early twenties, were were homeowners. We had uh, cars that were financed. We had credit cards that we were using to show that we were good stewards of debt. And um, unfortunately that took a turn because we were irresponsible with some of the credit cards that we used. Yeah, and one, one turning point for us is when I got laid off yeah. um, from my, my job. Um, my background is in engineering. And when I got laid off and that income left, that's when things started to like, oh, we need, really need multiple streams of income if we want to you know, protect ourselves and protect our family. We're not gonna be able to save our way through this thing mm -hmm. um, because after six months, I mean, what's, what are we going to do yeah. now? We were in a good place, but that really just changed us emotionally um, and mentally uh, to start taking, uh, being more on the offense instead of defense. Yeah. And I think a layoff and especially with what's going on now, but we were just very much uh, of the realization that, wait a second, we're not in control we thought we were in control because a paycheck was coming every two weeks and we were like, yes, that money's coming in. But in reality, we're not in control because it was literally taken from us. Mm -hmm. And so because we went through that experience together and, and had it, we were like, how can we make sure that we can guarantee some sort of income moving forward? And and that's really what the light bulb was, is instead of the, the Dave Ramsey method where, you know, just grinding it out, contributing to your 401k, we were like, again, we're still not in control. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out a different way 
that we can get in control. And that's where we started understanding Robert Kiyosaki and real estate and, and how to create passive income and not to only rely on one source of active income. Now, there was also a transition, uh, another uh, pivotal point in our lives, even in real estate, because I was transitioning from real estate. It was we were utilizing OPM, other people's money, uh, to invest in real estate. And at that point, we became the lenders. And we had private money lenders that were giving us money. And we would lend that money out to the real estate investors who were doing multiple flips at a time. So we were basically the middlemen. Then once we were introduced to this uh, concept of infinite banking, then we uh, basically said, we're not going to be lending anybody else's money. We're going to only lend our own money so that whenever we earn, whenever that interest is paid, it's only paid back to us. Now that transition was hard because you go from having hundreds of thousands of dollars, other people's money to not having any money. Again. So again, just, just those, those pivotal moments where we were like, wait a second, we thought what we were doing was great. And then the universe and God, whomever it was told us <laughs> something different. Nice. So at what point, how did you discover infinite banking? Right what's your best explanation to like new people that are, you know, going to be watching this video later on, like your, your best pitch on the <laughs> infinite banking concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, before you answer that, like, how did you come across it? Who did you listen to first and who exposed you to it? Totally. So um, to, to answer your question first, who exposed us to it? It was uh, an investor. So, mm -hmm. so like Darius said, as we were understanding our lending business, uh, we just learned that there were different characteristics of lenders. And what we, the lenders that we were dealing with were of the scarcity mindset of where's my money, where's my money, where's my money, what's going on with it, the flip, what's up, what's up. And um, we, we recognized that personality like instantly. And so what we did was we just started networking more aggressively and putting ourselves in front of individuals who were used to the world of investing, knew about investing and weren't so um, uh, afraid of getting involved in real estate investing. So for us, I would say uh, it was really just our, our mentor to, to this day where um, he, he just wrote us a check, no questions asked and said, uh, you have five years. And we said, wait a second, <laughs> five, five years? You don't want this back in like six months? He's like, no, five years and I'm gonna charge you if you pay me back before two years. And we're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I just I run that back with no strings attached what's going on and that was the immediate uh just realization of us realizing that we're dealing with a different caliber of investor yeah because we were like either this is drug money or <laughs> this is a really good opportunity here yeah what have what's we the missed catch? <laughs> what have we missed in, in our financial education training? <laughs> and then he started telling us about life insurance and like um you know, let's do this, let's do just this 50,000 first. And if you like it, then I'll give you more. Hmm. Wow. So <laughs> what do you do again? And um, who do you work with? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's really what, what started it is just that initial conversation because we, we came to the table with, with a fancy brochure and a PowerPoint presentation ready to go through the slides and show all of our experience. And he didn't even look at it. And so we, we just knew that we were at a different round table, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but to, to answer your question, as far as the pitch is concerned, um, what I would say, Darius, are you cool with some role playing? No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, <go ahead>. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it G-rated because we are married. No, teasing. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, uh, your savings account. Mm -hmm. Do you keep money in your savings account? Absolutely. And with your savings account right now, do you know how much the bank is paying you to keep your money in a savings account? They're paying me about 0.001%. Oh, that's super generous. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you're getting a few pennies on the dollar. So um, what I would say is, what if I could put your money in a different savings account mm -hmm. that pays you 4% guaranteed for life? Well, my savings account does the same thing. How does it do that? As long as I have the money in there, then they'll pay me my 0.001%. I said 4%. Oh, well, I like 4%. 
Okay, then I'm just making sure we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. So 4% for, for life, compound interest, the same way your savings account does. For those of you who may not be familiar with compound interest, you put your money in account, leave it there, and you'll earn interest compounding, compounding, compounding as your money grows. So with that, the other point of this savings account, there's another feature to it that is called a death benefit. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with life insurance? Yeah. If I die, then my beautiful wife gets a death benefit. Exactly. To cover your, your family. So the savings account also comes with a death benefit. Okay. Are you okay with that so far? Sounds good. Because right now, for just comparing apples to apples, your savings account in the bank is paying, you, you said, 0.01%. No death benefit, right. but you can put your money in a different environment, savings account that gives you 4% guaranteed and it provides a death benefit. Okay. We're, we're, to, we're together so far, right? Together so far. So life mm -hmm. insurance is being utilized as a savings account. Exactly. There we go. So let's take it a step further. In your savings account, have you ever had to use any money in your savings account? Yes. And what happened to that money? I'm no longer earning interest on the amount that I borrowed, mm -hmm. that I used. Exactly. That the compounding effect goes away because you disturb the principal, right. so to speak. So, and also, what happens with the money? You, you write a check for $5,000, what happens? It's gone in whatever I spent the $5,000 on. So now you have to earn all of that money back because it's gone and you mm -hmm. never see it again. So with this account that I'm talking about is you have access to your funds at any given point and you can pay back any of the money that you use over your entire lifetime. Okay, so you, I'm borrowing the funds yes. and I have to pay it back. Yes, you do. You should pay it back because if you pay it back, you continue to earn even more compound interest. Got it. So the point of this that I'm trying to share with you is all we know these days is that there's an ability to put our money in a savings account at the bank. We don't necessarily know that there's opportunities to put our savings account in other vehicles that might provide us a little bit more leverage, maybe a few more features that allow us to really control our funds and allow us to do whatever it is that we want. Now with this account, it just happens to be whole life insurance that is a high cash value account. So you can use your money at any given point, you can pay it back at any given point, and even if you use your money or you don't use your money, you're still earning the 4% guaranteed. Okay. So the benefit, the benefit of doing infinite banking and utilizing the funds is to uh, not withdraw the money, but to borrow the money and use it for something that we would traditionally use um, credit, uh, a high interest credit card for. Absolutely. So instead of paying the bank, the interest, high interest, then we want to pay ourselves that high interest instead. Exactly. Yeah, because all we're going to do is use a savings account as your own personal line of credit so that you can collect the interest instead of continuing to pay interest out to the banks. Cool. How, how does that sound to you? Cool. All right. I want in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like that. I hopefully, like that. That was, hopefully that was easy to follow. That's cool. That's cool. I'm definitely going to like consider like role playing when I'm like, you know, with my clients, just like yeah. presenting it. Cause I'm, I'm at a point now where it's like, you know, the people that reach out to me are, are just, they're so ready to do it. Mm -hmm. But like, I guess like when I'm, a, you know, just out and about, maybe like at a conference or something, I can like present that conversation the way that you guys did it. Very, very simple. You, you went straight to the savings account method, you know, that, that mentality and, everybody understands savings yes. mm -hmm. to a degree. It's just a matter of, you know, in the 21st century, where do I put my savings? Mm -hmm. We all know that it's good to save, but where do I save? Mm -hmm. You know, and that was, that was really good. I really appreciate that. So sure. with that being said, in this current environment that we're in, speaking about savings accounts and the money market accounts, the CDs, those savings accounts that were yielding two, 3%, you know, and now due to this outbreak, this global pandemic, I've noticed every single bank, almost every single bank has cut their 
uh, interest rates on savings accounts, checking accounts, money market accounts, CDs even. Everything is super, super low. Mm -hmm. So what is your take when you're, when you're talking to people that have savings and they don't even know that the interest rate has been cut, number one, and then number two, we're entering a possibility of a negative interest rate environment over the next maybe few months going into 2021. So what are your thoughts on that? And does it affect infinite banking people or infinite banking users, or does it actually benefit us quite a bit? Yeah. Good question. It, it benefits us quite a bit because like you said, when it comes to like those negative interest rates, what we're doing is we're basically on the brink of a recession. If, if we're not already they're already there. Mm -hmm. And what, what's happening is people are hoarding money. And in order for our economy to work, money has to stay in motion. And by us collectively as a group hoarding money, then we are literally shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and to, to break that down, what Darius is saying, hoarding money as consumers, we're not spending the, the money as quickly as it was as we were. Mm -hmm. So everyone just sitting on it because we're all scared that we're, we're not going to get our next paycheck. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, as you can see, businesses, there's a, an extreme reduction in capital. And now the government is scrambling to, to try to figure out how do we overcome this? Yeah. And now what's happening, because when we go to negative interest rates, the banks are actually being charged to keep their money in the uh, central bank. So if they are being charged, of course, that um, is going to trickle down to us. What the reserve is trying to, to do is get the banks to lend more money. Now, they have to find this happy, happy medium because people aren't spending money. If people aren't spending money, then you have to try to force the money on them through negative interest rates. Now, and low interest rates. Now, the, the combination of that, of, of unemployment, the, whatever happens with the recession is, we have prices that are going to drop like on our some of our assets. You may see some housing uh, prices go down. You may see opportunities where business, uh, they don't have as much money, so their costs go down. Uh, it, it's actually a, a, a issue with demand where we don't have as much demand. So we have to try to fix this artificially by creating the flow of money back into our system. So since we're not able to do that, the, the opportunity that it presents for um, infinite bankers is regardless of what they do, what they invest in, they're still going to be earning a 4% interest. They're still going to be earning a guaranteed interest. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you get it at a, of a low market value, whatever your investment is, and you're able to ride that wave back up to the top. Because what, what the problem is, is when things go down, people have no place to put their money. Like when the stock market goes down, if you were one of those ones fortunate enough to get your money before the market went down, where are you going to put it? Where you can continue to earn interest. Now, if you are an infinite banker, then you have basically um, space in your banking system where you can plug that hole back up and still continue to earn interest as, um, as the, the market goes down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're kind of riding this wave, and then when it goes back up, you get back into it, and you ride it, keep riding up to the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the, the general thing that people just need to understand right now, what's happening with interest rates, is it's all about understanding the consumer market. Banks, at the end of the day, are in business to lend money. They got to give you money. So they have to fi figure out the most... Or the, the, the biggest opportunity that they have to continue lending money. Mm -hmm. So they're going to significantly de decrease the cost of money or the interest rates that you pay to make it more enticing for you to use the bank's money. So for, for, for irresponsible consumers who we were with, with debt and, and not understanding how to leverage debt, we were in consumer debt, not leveraging debt, um, this can be very dangerous for, for individuals who see uh, interest rate at 0%, 1%, 2%, because now they're thinking, ooh, what am I going to do with this money? Whereas at, for someone who is more creative, uh, creatively, who is a creative financer or an investor, this is game time. 
<laughs> this is big, big wins here because money is cheap and you're able to flip money so much faster, so much quicker because you don't have um, some of the high interest rates that you may normally be dealing with. So as bankers, again, just to kind of say what Darius was talking about, for, for us, we are our own bailout. <laughs> Somebody, like our, our client told us that, yeah. so we, we can't even take credit for that. He was like, uh, B, BYOB, be your own uh, bailout. We're like, yes, <laughs> you get it. Um, shout out to, to Drew Davis. So um, anyways, if, if anything, it was just, again, realizing the control that we have. Mm -hmm. At any given point, we can tap into any of our policies because we have five at this point and we can use the money at our discretion. We can flip it how we want, no questions asked, and we have our entire lifetime to pay it back. And then additionally, because there's so much cheap money, why not leverage some of that cheap money to fund our banking businesses and allow that to grow exponentially? So it, it's, if anything, for bankers, this is... Uh, the opportunity uh, of wealth transfer, I would say right now. Yeah, the, the biggest opportunity is for people with money because just because the interest rates are at 0% or negative percentage, negative percentage, everyone doesn't have access to that money. And the, the reason why I say that is because even though a bank may offer you a 0% interest, let's say you're buying a house for $500,000, just for an example. Initially before this, the only thing you want to put down, the only thing you had to put down is like 5%. But because interest rates are so low, the risk factor is higher. So they have to mitigate that by saying, okay, instead of 5%, you need to put 15% down. What that does is that knocks off a ton of people who are higher risk who doesn't have any money. Yes. Very good point. I like it. I like it. Thank you. You know what? I'm, I'm noticing the, the passion uh, and the energy between you guys, which I also admire because, you know, I'm someone that came into this environment solo solo dolo right just like i was like hey i'm all in um i was listening earlier when you said you had lost your your job and that was the same thing that happened to me when i entered this environment i started realizing the importance of money and the urgency to actually like i actually need it now because of what's going on you know i lost my job no income coming in so your passion, your knowledge around infinite banking, the economy, the marketplace, you know, when you're talking to clients, at what point did you guys both say, this is our thing, you know, um, infinite banking, like, because I'm sure, um, you know, Carmen, what were you doing before? And Darius, you said you were an engineer. So like, at what point did you say, this is what we're going to do, infinite banking? And then what then made you go from becoming like a client, like a user of infinite banking to then transitioning to teaching it and actually selling it and sharing it with other people, because that takes a whole nother, uh, uh, what should I say? Purpose. So what, what did that spark from? Absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that happened for us is once we started using uh, the concept for our real estate business, we were well connected within the real estate industry in uh, Phoenix. So only thing we did is saying, hey, this is working for us. It should be able to work for you also. And the more we started telling our peers about it, the more questions we got. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to get questions, we're like, you know, we should probably be agents and the questions just continued and the opportunities just kept presenting itself and we ended up here where we are now not by choice but by necessity i would say um because if, if somebody asks you a question uh one of our mentors told us uh, somebody asks you a question more than twice and you should write a book we were constantly getting questions about <laughs> infinite banking and how to utilize life insurance policies instead of Hard money lending, for example, mm -hmm. because hard money lending, when it comes to real estate, is super, super expensive. I want to be a hard, I want it to be a hard money lender because <laughs> still want to be, <laughs> yeah, because that's where that's where the money is. You charge right. a higher percentage of interest, a higher percentage of interest rate for a short period of time, and investors are eating it up. So that's how that's Living how we money. that's how we started lending ourselves because we understood what the what hard money lenders were doing. So we would come in a lot lower than them, um, half, half where they are, and we would always have money to lend. 
Yeah, and, and I would say a part of this journey, um, just to give a little bit more context as well, Darius and I took a hard look at our families and our backgrounds. And we said, what do we want for ourselves? And what we saw isn't what we wanted. No. And, and so, <laughs> tell me how you really feel. <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so we said, all right, we got to do something about this. Um, so again, at, at every point, we, we challenged ourselves to, to be at the driver's seat. So, or, or to, to, to challenge ourselves as much as we could, because we thought what we were doing in corporate America, you know, climbing that ladder, we were aggressive with it. My background was in project management and construction, nothing to do with finance. Um, and so the commonality that we always had was we were always focused on money. Mm -hmm. Even if we didn't understand the world of money, but once we came together as a unit, we realized that we were so strong and so passionate and powerful when we came together about money. Like, you know, we would be having our, our budget committee meetings, um, having uh, strategy sessions about what we're doing with 20 bucks. And I think if anything from that, that just sparked the, the interest that we had for finance. Mm -hmm. And so then our friends and family just started asking us little questions about how, how are you saving? How are you budgeting? And, and it grew from there. And so if anything, along the way, we've been pulling and tugging our friends and family with us because we just wanted to share just genuinely. We wanted to share because we said, if, if we can do this, we know anybody else can do it. Mm -hmm. And as we stumbled into infinite banking, we realized we were on a whole nother playing field. And we said, the world needs, to know about this and, and and that's just really what it is so we got licensed immediately it was a no-brainer and we just hit the streets and started door knocking and like literally trying to speak to everyone that we could about banking and it wasn't until one of our clients said hey start a youtube channel you can reach the world and we're like all right let's do it <laughs> and and here we are so um if anything i would just say um we are just genuinely interested in, in trying to, to serve others who are seeking financial independence. Yeah. And, and one thing I would say is the reason why a lot of people don't know about in, uh, infinite banking is because banks have far better marketing than infinite banking. <laughs> um, True. <laughs> we, we live in a capitalist society. And even though you have a bad product, if your marketing is good, people will buy it. For sure. Totally agree with that. So with that being said, with that being said, um, who, who was your mentor? Who taught you uh, infinite banking? Did somebody sit you down or were you like me where you had not a dollar to spend and you were just like hoarding, uh, just, just mangling, going through any YouTube video you could find and any resource about uh, uh, infinite banking and typing in all the other terms that they use, become your own banker, tax-free banking, bank on yourself, <laughs> family banking, <laughs> all this stuff. <laughs> it was a little bit of both, I'd say. So the, the mentor was the gentleman who, who lent us the money uh, in the first place okay. for one of our real estate deals. So literally, you know, when we sat down with him and he said, I'll give you $50,000 uh, at 10% amortized over five years, we we're like, wait a second. Well, before we said, wait a second, we <laughs> left. Um, <laughs> so he didn't change his mind. <laughs> and then a few days later, once the check cleared, <laughs> We started asking questions. We called and was like, okay, let, let's talk business. <laughs> um, so, so anyways, he, um, he was very, very thorough in his approach and we really, oh, we, we just love it now because before we just felt like uh, he was withholding information, like just tell us what's going on. But he, he, he was planting seeds. So uh, it was just, he, he gave us as much as he thought we could handle at the time of just really understanding money because he, he I guess he felt our passion for it, but like you said, Denzel. And so um, he, he just said, when we said, you know, where does your source of funds come from? Life insurance. Life insurance? Why, why would you use life insurance? A little more, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was just those conversations. And then he, he would just give us these gold nuggets where he was like, you know, there, there's more. Um, there's more people that have money than people that know how to ask for it. I'm like, what is that? Well, that's deep. Right? <laughs> that was just deep. Man, I'm going to pray on that one. <laughs> yeah, right? That just hit you. We're like, what does that mean? And how Can you say we... that one more time? It just, it, it left me too fast. <laughs> there's, there's more people that have money than people that know how to ask for it. Oh, my God. That's deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that one. That was probably my biggest takeaway right there. 
Yeah. Oh, that's not us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not us. Um, so, uh, and then the other thing, like his just way of explaining money. So when we talk about retirement accounts, he would say, um, are you going to take a loaf of bread and put it in, in the freezer and wait 30 years to eat it? And I'm like, why would we do that? That'd be some stale ass bread. <laughs> and he was like, well, that's what you're doing with your retirement accounts. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Huh. You know, so it's just these little nuggets that he kept giving yeah. us, um, because really what he what he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that money is food and food is money. Mm. Right. In this exchange that we have in this world, everything costs money. This mug costs money. Our cell phones cost money. We can sell any of these things for money. So when we talk about currency, all of these things are a form of currency. But yet, the other nugget, Denzel, take this. We, we do things with money that we don't do with things money buys. Ooh. We do things with money that we don't do with things money buys. So what he was saying was, again, going back to that frozen bread reference, we do things with money that we don't do with things money buys. We take our money and put it up for 30 plus years and don't touch it. But with the things money buys, we keep it in motion. Because if we don't eat the bread, it spoils. If we don't use our cell phone, it goes dead. If we buy a house and don't live in it, it's going to fall apart. Exactly. So hmm. why do we do things with money that we don't do the same thing that money buys if food is money and money is food? Man. That is, that is so powerful. And when people hear this, we're the radical ones. But it's like, wait a minute. This is oh so simple. Um, and just, it's logical. This isn't, we're not getting into uh, any sort of philosophy here. This is a logical, fundamental thing. And it's crazy. Yesterday, I had a conversation with a, uh, a financial planner whom I got connected to from another YouTube channel and um, another, another kingdom person, you know, in the faith. The minute I brought up life insurance, this person took a turn and they immediately said, they were like, I hope you're ready. Put your, put your big boy pants on. I am a huge non-believer in life insurance, that it is the worst, most expensive asset a customer can buy for their family. It is the worst turnover. It is the worst performing asset, most expensive. And I just sat there in awe and I'm like, okay, so what you're telling your clients is exactly the reference that you said. Take that loaf of bread, store it in the freezer for 40 years, not 30. 40 years, okay? And then eat it little by little. So, so not only is that loaf of bread gonna kill you, my friend, 40 years from now, because it's gonna have mold and, and just freeze a burn to, you know, it's gonna be horrible. Exactly. But now, not only are you just gonna eat it quickly to, you know, like you know this loaf of bread is gonna kill you, so you would, you would eat it quickly if that's all you had to do, if that was, you know, get it over with, let me go see my Lord, no. <laughs> You're going to suffer. You're going to take pieces of bread so it'll kill you slowly, right? Kind of like smoking cigarettes. It'll kill you nice and slow. You, you, you'll live, but you'll have coughing problems. Your liver will fail. Your lungs will fail. So same thing. You're eating this contaminated loaf of bread, freezer burn, terrible mold. You got things growing on it, and you're eating it nice and slowly because through your distributions. And then on top of that, because you ate the loaf of bread, Uncle Sam, who made the bread uh, or didn't make the bread, is going to tax you on it. You, know? <laughs> you both so get not pieces. Only, not, only, yeah, not only are you going to die in the grave, but now you're going you're gonna to go in the grave with debt. And, you're, and your next generation is going to owe on a dead man or a dead woman. Mm -hmm. So that whole – and that, that – it scares me because the average person, majority of Americans – We'll follow that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, this, this, this is insane. This is more than um, 
anything that we could imagine. The biggest, you know, uh, uh, misconception, the biggest lie that we feed our children, Mm -hmm. our children's children. Mm -hmm. Put your money up away for 30, 40 years and you'll live happily ever after. And so when I heard that from that financial planner, I'm not sure if you guys had an experience like this. I'm sure you do. And when you talk to people that maybe have a different, you know, viewpoints, but it's like, how can someone go that far off (laughs) the edge to say that life insurance, period, they were saying period, term, whole life, universe, everything. Anything. And they didn't even, they didn't, they didn't know infinite banking. And I knew they didn't know it because they were going to the traditional designs of like whole life and universal. But just the fact that they weren't even like willing to hear it. Like, and they were trying to get me to say, Hey, um, you know, you, you don't, you don't, I understand you have to make money and pay bills and, and yada, yada. But uh, I've never met an insurance agent that, that did it for the whole life until they realized what I was doing or something like that. And I was like, well, uh, well, you met the first person <laughs> because <laughs> number one, I don't need infinite banking to survive. Right. Um, I, have multiple, I have multiple streams of income. So yes, I'm yes. your first one. And I know others like you guys mm-hmm. and others that we don't necessarily rely on infinite banking. We just know how powerful it is and how effective it can be for our money. Mm -hmm. And then we have multiple streams of income, you know, YouTube, you make YouTube videos. So you're getting Mm -hmm. monetized, real estate, lending, you know, referral marketing, sales. So yeah, I'm so glad that take on that. I'm so glad that you said that. I I just want to address what you just said. We're not relying on infinite banking. Infinite banking is just a tool. I feel that so many people who come to us are the infinite banking is their end all be all. You know, looking at that illustration is the end all be all. What's my dividends? What's the growth year after year? And we're like, wait a second, we need big picture. Because when we think about the policy, the policy is just a tool that we're using to move money in. We have to keep money in motion. So we have to have multiple streams of income. All we're doing is creating a cycle or a loop and money passes through a policy and then we keep it moving. Like what we focus on in our, in our personal and, and professional lives when it comes to our policy, the policy is like a, a split second conversation. Is it coming from this policy? Which policy is coming from? We keep it moving. We spend so much more time strategizing where we're going to get our income from, how we're going to flip money, um, that that bank, that infinite banking, the policy is just one phase of this. So I'm so glad that you said that because sometimes we just feel people only see tunnel vision and they're like, the, the policy is going to be my key to financial freedom. No, multiple streams is going to be your key to, to financial freedom. Banking is going to help accelerate that, but we need to keep, we need to figure out how to keep money in motion. Yeah. And I, I think the, the reason why we tend to have these conversations with uh, financial planners and, and the average person is because of the way they've been conditioned over their lifetime. We've been conditioned to do things a, a certain way from our society, from our families, from uh, the groups that we surround ourselves with. Yeah. And a lot of times people say whole life insurance, like you said, is a waste of money. Traditional whole life insurance is a waste of money. It's expensive. Why would you do that? But when you start to open your mind up like for example when we went to one of the conferences with uh, one of our mentors we were the youngest people there by far and they even asked us if we were in the right room yeah (laughs) and we weren't we were surrounded by people that had uh uh, practices uh they were doctors they were lawyers they were inventors they were bank owners there there were ambassadors it was I personally thought we were at a uh, Illuminati meetup because of <laughs> the p- caliber of people there and the amounts of money that they're putting into life insurance to invest in their business and their practice and pay their employees were out outrageous. The, the conversations in that room were just 
astounding. And so again, that perspective, like you said, Denzel, we, we start to really understand the, the different investors, the different financial professionals, the, the people who are doing certain things, because it instantly you can tell in the conversation how it's going to go. Right. And so for us, we just chose to focus on, on, on what the ambassadors and the inventors and the business owners and the real estate investors were doing, because they understand money. Yeah. And, and, and what I really feel like this all just boils down to is we have all been lied to as far as how money works, uh, how you should use it, and who should control it. And when we run into those individuals who aren't fans of whole life insurance or fans of retirement accounts or whatever, or whatever, it, it's just, again, understanding how the game is played. Yeah. And, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We never want to reinvent the wheel. We're always going to look to the people who have money and ask them what they're doing, <laughs> follow what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if anything, for us, it was just the, the ability to say, okay, um, if the banks are one of the most profitable businesses of all time, why don't we just do what they're doing on our own scale? Yeah. And we even came across how churches and nonprofits are using whole life insurance and infinite banking, like crazy. Yeah. And, and all we're doing is moving money. No bank is storing money anywhere because they have to keep their money in motion. No successful business is storing money anywhere. They need to keep money in motion. They need cash flow. That's what I'm saying at the end of the day, because as you see what happens when there's no cash flow, everyone shuts their doors. And we have negative interest rates, so people uh, <laughs> lose money. So it, it's just the concept. But we always say keep money in motion, keep money in motion. We mean it literally. So with that being said, the, the, um, the common argument that from the other side to uh, combat, you know, the whole whole life insurance and, you know, even just infinite banking, people that are familiar with the concept but don't like it, their consistent argument is – that whole life is expensive. The the fees are a lot. Uh, you know, you you can't access your money that well, which is not true, obviously, because you know we're doing infinite bank, we access it pretty well. Yeah. But then they do the they do the hundred thousand dollar comparison, where they say if I have a hundred thousand dollars in whole life versus a hundred thousand dollars growing in the S and P, I'm gonna earn more than you. And I constantly agree with them. I'm saying, yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. Hundred thousand in the S and P will most likely, you know, give you an average maybe eight percent, maybe ten. Who knows? Whatever the rate is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever number you get, great. That is true. Factor in your internal rate of return. Number one, what is your fees? Because you have them too. Let's not fool anybody. Okay. So you got fees and we got fees. We get that. Okay. So what's your internal rate of return on that S and P five hundred return on the hundred thousand dollars? If we're just looking at a 100k capital the the next thing i i you know say to them is okay you can't access that money for 40 years so it's going to grow for 40 years and then you access it so if you're if we're going to compare and contrast the two vehicles we have to use all the tools and features available so we can't just say that this hundred thousand in the whole life is going to grow at four percent, because that is also not true. <laughs> we have the ability to take out this hundred k in cash value, say ninety percent of it, and I'm gonna go buy a piece of property, and maybe go acquire four or five times that amount in debt to acquire maybe a half a million, a million dollar property, a four unit piece of real estate, and cash flow. 1500 a month. Now, now I'm earning 4% on a hundred K and I'm earning whatever the percentage is 1500 cash flow times 12 times 10 years. Then you factor in depreciation on assets, tax deductions. <laughs> I have two assets working in two places. So let's really get down to the, the nitty gritty of <laughs> you know, apples to apples comparison, right? And so with that being said, when you get those those arguments, how do you respond? Do you say things like that or do you bring up another story? Like what are some things that you bring up to combat that argument? A hundred thousand in the S P growing at X percentage versus 
a hundred thousand dollars growing in cash value, high cash value yeah. for infinite banking. We have conversations with people who want to have conversations. We're not trying to convince anybody of infinite banking because we know it works. <laughs> so you come sometimes we come across people who are just gun ho that it doesn't work. Whatever you believe will be true. Mm. So Darius, <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. So your your mindset will make whatever you believe true. Yeah. So there's there's certain people that you can't combat combat. Talk you to know, talk to them. So if there is a dialogue that we're having with people, then we'll share stories. Because name some name another product that you can be in multiple places at once and still earn interest. Name a, a don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> name, <laughs> name another product where you can earn compound interest. Because again, in order for compound interest to work, the money has to stay there. In order mm -hmm. for your money to work in the S P, it has to stay there. And the S P has to perform a certain way for you to get that uh, to get money. You can have an average rate of return of 10 and still lose money, or you can you know, have your money in one of these products like a whole life insurance uh, product mm -hmm. that's been around before taxes and before the S&P. Yeah. And, and Denzel, that was a beautiful illustration that you just gave us. I love it because again, what we're talking about is the money game. So first and foremost, when we're having this conversation with an individual, we realize that they don't understand the difference between actual rate of return and the average rate of return. We know that this individual doesn't understand the difference between savings and investing. So let me back up when I say that average rate of return versus actual rate of return. The, the market is always going to predict some sexy interest rate, 10, 12% really what it is. But when it comes down to it, you're probably making more like six to eight on a good day. That's your actual rate of return. Check your statements, people, and then factor in your fees. So really, we're probably neck and neck at this point where we're talking about the earning potential. The next thing that we're talking about is the difference between saving versus, versus investing. We're putting money up in a savings vehicle. We're not taking our savings and investing it with the potential to just lose that money. We're keeping our savings account grounded and secure and leveraging that savings account to create cash flow. Mm -hmm. that allows us to be in multiple places at once. So just off of the, the brink of understanding the money game, we need to first come to that conversation of making sure that we all have the same understanding of what's going on. Because you're right, time and time again, we get people who fight us tooth and nail and say, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to get much more money in the S&P. And we're like, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. But you'll have one house and we'll have the whole neighborhood. It's just that simple. As, as we're talking, you know, I just, the, the most expensive thing that we do as the average person or human beings is work a job. That is the most expensive, expensive thing that we can do because when we go and work a job, we're uh, W-2 employees. They take taxes out before we even get paid. So you have a 30, 25, 30% reduction on your income before you even earn it, before you even get it direct deposited in your account. But we say nothing about that. We don't have any issues with that. Now, when you have a business, on the other hand, you have opportunities to uh, mitigate those loss through uh, tax write-offs. So just simply positioning ourselves to be, to have a business on the side of our, of our uh, job or guaranteed income whatever you want to call it, just by having a business on the, on the side will put us in a better financial position, even before we get to investing, even before we get to figuring out what type of cash flow we're going to have. If we have an LLC where we're able to mitigate some of those tax, um, tax deductions, <laughs> deductions <laughs> then we put ourselves in a better place. It's all about taxes and interest before we even get to investing. <laughs> taxes and mm. interest. Okay, I like that. I like that. So I want to I want to close it out here um, with some nuggets that you can uh, give to my community give to my audience and and obviously share with your people as well and all the new people that are going to eventually find us whether it be now or five years from now when they watch <laughs> this video. Yeah, is this is a historic moment 
time that we are in, 2020, it's May. What are you currently um, doing with your infinite banking policy as of, or policies as of right now, if you'd be willing to share like what maybe one or two specific things that you are utilizing your infinite banking policy. We, we understand that you're storing money in there safely and saving it, but when you take it out, what are you doing with that money? And then how are you operating it mm -hmm. in 2020 in this historic unforeseen time? Because mm -hmm. this video right here could go viral. We don't know. <laughs> so, 10 years down the road, five years down the road, when they look back, they'll consider us gurus or mm -hmm. they'll consider us financial experts if we say the right thing right now <laughs> in terms of what we're doing with our money and what that return would look like a decade from now. Yeah, go ahead and Denzel, affirm it. I like it, sir. Um, what aren't we doing? But what I would say for, for, for us, the biggest thing that's stretching us with our comfort zone right now is, is financing policies. What I mean by that is there is an industry out there of banks who will give you capital to buy whole life insurance. What does that mean for to you? It is an asset to the bank. I don't even think we talked about that. The banks realize the importance of whole life insurance because they are one of the largest purchasers of whole life insurance. So if I can come to the bank with- My a, life insurance policy, my life get a loan. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think I'm gonna to try to go to the bank to get some loans? Wow. I haven't tried that yet. Mm -hmm. oh. I want to try that. I want to look at that. Go to a local <laughs> bank. As you say, Denzel, local banks. <laughs> Go to a local bank okay. where you've already established a relationship and ask them if you could collateralize your policy to get a loan from the bank. At that point, you haven't used any money from your policy, right? But you've gotten a loan from the bank. Now you can take that loan and you can do other things with it, right? While you still have your policy untouched. So cash value collateral loans. Is that mm -hmm. what you're getting at? Yep. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'm in the, okay. Now I, now I got the terminology. So I know, I, now I know what you're talking about and, yeah. and I'm actually creeping on it right now. <laughs> there, there, there we go. I didn't, I didn't know I can go to any bank. That's what I didn't know. Or any, <laughs> any local bank. I thought there were like very, very few. You'll have but, to, there is a selection. It's not like Wells Fargo or Bank of America is just going right. to, you know, t take you. But I would say f find a local bank and start negotiating with them because at the end of the day, as, as we always talk about with Velocity Banking, get you a line of credit. Mm -hmm. How about we get some collateral and let's keep that money moving. So how many times can you flip that money to either get more policies or more assets? Because guess what's going to happen when that line of credit is paid off? We got more policies for how much money? and we're flipping money. So I would say for us, that's the biggest thing right now is re recognizing and taking advantage of all the cheap money that's out there that we have some opportunities to literally expand our banking systems. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a really weird position to be in to have more money than you uh, have places to put it. <laughs> yeah. um, because at the, at the end of the day, you wanna do the re reverse of what everybody else is doing. <laughs> People are hoarding money. So, our job right now is to go out there and find ways to move money, spend money. Because when you think of multi-billionaires, how much money do you think they have in their checking and savings account? Not as much as they have invested in their business and assets. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to look at the market and see where those gaps are. Yeah. The gaps that present itself are different from, are, are different depending on the individual because of their strengths. So you have to utilize your strengths and your abilities to find what works best for you. Because Denzel, you may be amazing at uh, getting uh, fourplexes. Me, on the other hand, scared to death because of the experience that I had in the past. So we may be looking for different type of assets because of our strength. So it all depends on the individual. Money is a reflection of the decisions you make as an individual, not what we tell you, not what Mr. Rodriguez tells you, it's a reflection of you. So if you have it, that means you are a good steward of it. If you don't, that means you're not. Mm -hmm. Money is always a reflection. Yeah. And so for, for us at the end of the day, it's just about, because we have a growing family, so we're trying to figure out how many uh, foundations 
essentially we, we're considering our banking, our, our policies, foundations, how many foundations can we create in a short period of time for as little money as possible and leveraging OPM. Mm -hmm. So I would say this is the facet that we're, we're, we're venturing into because before with, with everything that we've done with banking, we've used it to pay off our, our lifestyle expenses, our business expenses, and now we're just taking it up a notch. So we're going, all right, let's velocity bank this thing, but use oh. it to, <laughs> I like it, right? But, but let's use it to buy more policies and, and just leverage 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 our potential with the banks yeah one thing that we we do with our business is we pay all of our expenses up for the year and when you pay your expenses up for the year especially when it comes to software they give you huge discounts yeah so yes. we just start paying those monthly payments back to our banking system and recovering those interests is already built in and writing it off because it's a business expense hey -o. so uh yes. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. multiple wins there to close out, where can we find you? Uh, give us your YouTube channel information. Um, how can we follow you and, 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 you know, learn from you and so that the two of us, our, our audiences, our clients can get that much closer together. Because like you said, this is a tight community. Yeah. And my goal over the last few months has been to reach out a hand to those that are in the same industry. We, we speak the same language. We're all debt free as, mm -hmm. as influencers and leaders and people that are, you know, uh, in the authority space, right? So at this point, we're engaging in high level thinking, high intellectual conversations that our audiences can get lost in. So the way that I talk, I might lose somebody. But then when they hit your channel, they see two faces, a couple in alignment spiritually financially physically emotionally and then it might click for them so i would rather that person not get lost in the sauce from me and be able to see you and say i got it you know whether or not they became my client or not i'm at this point where i am blessed financially i don't need every single person yeah. to enroll in my business become my client mm -hmm. i want people to work with who they want to work with mm -hmm. because they know like and trust them Mm -hmm. So tell me, where, where can we find you? Well, the first thing I want to say is that we aren't debt free. We just own our debt. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'll, I'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> correction, correction. But uh, thank you again, Denzel, for this opportunity. You all can find us at, at Wealth Nation. Just find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Wealth Nation. Uh, WealthNation.io is also our Facebook and Instagram handle if you want to follow us there. Um, but everything that we do is on YouTube. So, so go ahead and check us out. Subscribe, hit the like button, engage with our channel. Uh, we appreciate the support. And if anything, we, we just love the opportunity uh, to have a conversation with you, Denzel. It, it's so powerful. A any day that we see your face is, is an amazing day because we just know that we're going to learn so much from each other. And uh, we just thank you again for, for reaching out to us and saying, hey, how can we share and serve? And so that's always our mission. Mm -hmm. It, Like you said, it doesn't matter who you get the information from, as long as you get the information and you take action, <clears throat> that's all that we ask at the end of the day so that you can build wealth for your family and your, your family's family. Yeah, wealth doesn't happen without taking action. And one thing I want to say, Denzel, is we were interviewing another uh, YouTuber who has like over 250,000 subscribers. And he said he did the interview because we did an interview with you. So well, kudos, yeah. kudos to you, my, my friend. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Very influential. We'll, we'll tell you offline who that individual was. But um, yeah. he was like, yeah, I saw Denzel on your channel. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. We're like, whatever it takes. <laughs> 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 um, so we're, we're just, again, just, just very, very honored to be in your presence. And, and thank you. Um, to, to your channel, to your followers, to your subscribers uh, for, for, for listening to our conversation. Wow, this has been fun. Thank you so much. God bless. Um, everybody else have a wonderful day and God bless. Mm -hmm.